The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8 is our text this morning. Luke chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet... When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Will you pray with me? Now, O God, we come before you with heavy hearts open to you. Lord, now we seek to hear a word. Your word, not whatever words I put in the way, but your words that speak to us, that call us, that shape us, that challenge us. Give us ears to hear, O God, your words. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I looked around the room and I couldn't find her. And so I leaned over and asked, where's Mama? I asked my sister as we were all sitting around the room eating macaroni and cheese, fried chicken, butter beans, and other random spoonfuls of things and casserole dishes on styrofoam plates that were honestly too cheap and flimsy to hold everything. My sister said, I don't know. She probably went outside to smoke. That's how my sister talks whenever she mentions anything about my mom or my dad smoking. I thought, well, yeah, probably, because she can't smoke in here. You see, my aunt and her husband had just bought a brand new double-wide trailer, and they invited us all over to show it off, to have a sort of housewarming party, you know, to... So all of us gathered up over at her house, and we all brought covered dishes and cake plates because, boy, it was like Thanksgiving. Somebody's got something new, going to show it off. Let's go. It reminded me of an old uh, a joke Jeff Fox really told. I don't like to tell jokes in the pulpit, but he said, you know, you know you're a redneck if somebody in your family gets a new house and you have to go help take the wheels off of it. <laughs> well, we didn't have to help take the wheels off. They were already off, but we got there. and My aunt showed us around. It was nice. Open kitchen with its new matching appliances, even had a dishwasher, a refrigerator with ice and water in the door, had a large living room with what my uncle was sure to tell us were genuine, real, two-before-studded walls, had a fireplace with gas logs, their own dining room, three big bedrooms, and the master suite even had a, had a bathroom. You walked in through two swinging doors with a jacuzzi tub. And they talked about how nice it was to have this new central heat pump that kept it cool in the summer and warm in the winter. They talked about their plans to build a big front porch and a big back deck to surround the pool. It was all nice. It smelled nice in there. It was the nicest, newest thing anyone in our family had ever had, at least that I could remember. So after we'd all gotten the grand tour, we were sitting around eating, and that's when I noticed that Mama wasn't there. So when my sister said she was outside, I got up, walked out the back door, and sure enough, there was Mama sitting on the back uh, there with her arms crossed, as she sometimes did with a cigarette in her mouth, and tears in her eyes. 
I said, Mama, what's wrong? And she said, we'll never have anything like this. We had lived in the same rental house on North Hill Street in Enterprise for seven years. This inexpensive three-bedroom, one-bath house with hardwood floors and cable that we never paid for uh, because either they forgot to shut it off or my stepdad was really good at borrowing it from the neighbors. You can still drive by there if you want, but the house is gone. The lot is overgrown with, with catawba trees and kudzu taken by the same tornado that had hit the high school back in 2007, and the owners were either too old or too just apathetic to rebuild it. And I suppose Mama thought we were going to be doomed to live in that little house for the foreseeable future, never having a place to call our own. I was 14 years old. I could count the number of times I had actually been to church, the number of times I had actually prayed on both hands with a few fingers left over. But I remember that night, as we drove home to Hill Street in our blistered Ford Taurus station wagon, I watched the moon follow us home, and I prayed. God, if you're up there, if you could see to it, it sure would be nice if you got my mama a house. Well, as it turned out, a few months later, mama came home from work at the nursing home, or she was a nursing assistant at the time, and told us, pack your bags. We're going to move across town to our own trailer, on our own land. Because a retiring nurse there had decided to help Mama out and finance the purchase of her old house so we could all live there. My mom and my stepdad still live on that property, though they live now in a much newer trailer. I bet you've heard stories similar to that, haven't you? Maybe you've got your own story like that about, about praying for something, something you know is just out of your reach, something you know you just couldn't get on your own. So you turn to God, praying as earnest as you knew how, maybe even bargaining with God. None of you have done that, right? None of you have prayed like I have. God, if you'll do this, I promise I'll go to church every Sunday. I've said that as a pastor, by the way, just so you, you know. If you'll do this, I'll sing in the choir, Jesus. I'll go to Sunday school. I'll tithe when I can afford it, when I can, uh, when, you know, I can give that much. I'm willing to bet most of us, if not all of us, have prayed some prayer like that before. Why do we do that? Why do we treat prayer as a last resort? Why do we only turn to prayer when it's time for some sort of intervention that we can't provide or afford ourselves. Why do we have this tendency to retreat to prayer in those tense moments in our lives? Those times when literally all we can do is pray. Is prayer more than that? Is it more than a recitation of a list of names, some memorized prayers, the, the offering of thanks for supper? A bedside courtesy at the hospital? Or is prayer to be kept behind glass only to be broken in case of an emergency? Or is prayer like a good pair of boots, well worn from miles of trails and pavement? I suppose with parables like the one in front of us this morning, we might get the idea that prayer is this incessant nagging of God. This constant petitioning to God for those things that are just out of our reach. Those things that we so desperately need, yet we are powerless to bring about. But to follow that logic, we have to assume that if we constantly pray, and if we spend all of our time on our knees begging and pleading with God, that God will give us all that we ask for, right? After all, Jesus says... Will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? But you know, you know just as well as I do, that there are those times when you plead, when your eyes won't stop flowing with tears, when you've begged, bargained, and shook your fists at heaven to God. If he'll just grant that one Thing, that one thing, 
only to hear nothing back. To hear that the cancer has spread. That someone else got the job. To have your heart broken and your soul torn. So is this a parable about those desperate times in our lives when we can't do it ourselves? To take our concerns to God, banging on the proverbial front door of heaven until God gives us an answer? Maybe. Or maybe there's something, something in the nature of the widow's request in Jesus' parable. Did you catch it? Grant me justice against my opponent. That's what she said. This widow needs justice to be set right, to be made whole. And who's going to help her? There are none of those oh-so-helpful billboard attorneys in ancient Judea with their number, their website plastered across it. They're not there. There's no family to support her. She's a widow. There's no nonprofit with a mission to advocate for the voiceless. No, no. She's on her own. She could choose to simply accept her fate, as so many do, to live with their pain, to live with their injustice, to just go on as if their voice and their lives don't matter. She could choose to do that, to live with whatever injustice, whatever cruelty has been inflicted upon her, or she can choose the other alternative, the harder thing, to fight for herself, to shout until her voice is heard, to refuse to carry on as if her life doesn't matter, because her life does matter. Her voice matters. Her story matters. Maybe, maybe there's something in this parable for those of us who have less to ask and more to give. Maybe there's something in this parable, something in these words from Jesus, about, for those of us who who do less asking and ought to do more listening. Maybe there's something in here about praying for opportunities to hear the voices of those who are pleading, who are begging, who are screaming for their voices to be heard, for their prayers to be answered by those of us with resources, with power, with privilege to help bring about their justice. I mean... If an unjust judge who doesn't care for God or for anyone else can hear the persistent pleading of a first century widow, a woman void of value in his day, if an unjust judge can hear her pleading and grant her justice, how much more should those of us living in the name of Christ today hear the prayers and pleading of those on the margin, those in the shadow, those overlooked, ignored, displaced, and forgotten, and do everything we can to bring them justice that they deserve. Are we better than the unjust judge? Of course, Luke introduces this parable from Jesus with these words. Then Jesus told them a parable, his disciples, about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. Isn't that interesting? about our need to pray always. Should we pray like this always? That seems a bit much, seems a bit dramatic to me, right? Should we pray like this, like a, like a widow begging for justice, banging on the door of a judge? Should we pray like this always? I mean, we've got resources, right? We've got talents, we've got abilities, we've got money. Do we have to pray always? We don't really need to pray always, do we? What I mean is, maybe, do we really have all we think we have? Are we really as self-sufficient as we think we are? Because I'm going to tell you, friends, I, I, I'm, I can get by pretty well on my own. I know which way to turn a wrench and a screwdriver. I know which end of a hammer to swing. I can speak a little bit of Spanish. I don't know if that ever helps. It definitely doesn't help speak Koine or Hebrew. I can tell you that. But I used to think I was pretty independent, able to get around, to make it through the world all by myself. I don't really need much help. I thought that 
until I found myself on the Dutch side of the Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. I had directions printed in my hand about how to get to my Airbnb, where I was going to stay during my time at the International Baptist Theological Study Center. But I had no idea what the difference between a train, a metro, and a tram was. None at all. And when I got off the plane, I stumbled around. I literally tried to duck under a rope and knocked it over. And of all things, a Scottish security guard came over and said, What do you think you're doing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he pointed me toward customs. I got through, got in the main airport, looked around. Well, there was a Burger King. There was one of those, those weird news places that sells peanut M&M's. Those are in every airport for some reason. But I needed a, a chip cart. I needed to have access to the public transportation system. I had no idea what I was doing. And this kind airport employee, it was obvious, this big, large, fat man from America doesn't know where he's going. And she walked me over to the window and sat there as I told them what I needed to do. I got my card and I went down to get on the train, scanned it, stood there, and of all things, a man wearing an Auburn polo shirt. War Eagle, right? Or, you know, this isn't in the sermon, Sikkim Bears, I mean, right? Um, walks over to me and says, you look lost. I said, really? I had a giant orange suitcase in my backpack. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm trying to get downtown to Amsterdam. He goes, oh, that's nice. This train goes to Germany. <laughs> so I went back up, went around. I should have got on it and asked if they knew Mike Duncan when I got over there. Went up, went around, got on the next one, going to Amsterdam. Got off the train, got on what I thought was the metro, but instead got on the tram, and it took me to the wrong end of the street that I was supposed to get on. If it wasn't for a sleepy Muslim shop owner and his cat, who let me borrow his phone to look up directions and then explain those directions to me, I might still be wandering up and down Rembrandt Park on Postjeveg, wondering, where am I supposed to be? Where am I going? There were countless times on that trip where I learned that I'm not really as self-reliant as I'd like to think that I am. Times when I was shown that asking for help just to get down the street is an act of prayer. An act of relying on something outside of myself. And maybe that's what prayer is, really. At the very act of prayer, not our words, not the things we say, because sometimes we don't know what we're saying, but the very act of prayer is an act of confession. Confessing our own real helplessness, our own real need for something outside of ourselves. That prayer is an act of confessing our need, our hope in God. And not just, not just when the going gets tough, not just when we run out of options, but always. Maybe prayer, maybe prayer is the constant reminder that we are not alone in this life. Because we are incapable of being left alone in it. Even when we don't know what we're praying to, sitting in the back of a station wagon looking at the moon. Even if we don't know the words to say, sitting by the bedside, we're not alone. To join in that cry for justice is one that comes persistently. Because we, all of us, have to hear it. To join it as it rises to meet God's ears. That prayer is the persistent presence of our relationship with God. One that doesn't let us tune out God until we need him. So I wonder, what would happen? What would happen to each one of us? If we truly lived each day praying as the widow in Jesus' parable, never letting up, always trusting that there's something greater than our smallness, something outside of our individual weakness, 
What would happen to Christ's church if we truly understood prayer as the persistent presence of God in and around us? What would the world look like if Christ's church heard the determined cries of those seeking justice and sought to be Christ's body, acting to bring justice with our power and our privilege? What would we look like if we joined in the suffering of injustice? If we joined our voices to theirs, to those unjust judges in the world? What would it look like if we prayed? Trusting God to be more than we are individually? Confessing by our act of prayer that we are, in the end, helpless. Hopeless. Without God. What would it look like if every breath we exhaled was a prayer Reminding us of that constant presence of the divine. Reminding us that we are not in this alone. Reminding us that God is with us. What would it look like? What would we look like? What would the world look like? I wonder. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us, especially Lord, in the days ahead, Be mindful of your presence in and around us. Encourage us, Lord. Strengthen us to pray. To see our act of prayer as a confession. That we can't do this alone. To see our acts of prayer confessing our hope in you. Even if we don't fully know what it means fully understand it yet. Holy Spirit, be with us. Be with us as we pray, even even in those times when it's just by the very breath we take. Be with us now. Move among us. Call us. Help us to pray. To respond to your presence among us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.